Well, good morning, Northland. Good morning. Oh, that was perfect. Well, hey, we are worshiping a generous God this morning. And as part of a celebration in this service, at the end, we are having baptisms at the end of the service. Are you excited? Yeah. Hey, if you're getting baptized, would you slip your hand up really fast? Yes. There are at least 20 people getting baptized today, and we are so excited. So we'll give you more instruction on that later. But right now, would you stand as we worship this generous God? Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes. I can count the times I've called name some broken night. And you showed up patch me up like you do every time I get amnesia I forget that you keep coming around you in no way ever let me down down good God almighty I hope you'll find me praising your name no matter what comes cause I know Power 
and have a seat, family. We're going to share a meal together. The communion, you may have uh, picked up some of these elements on your way in. Friends, uh, online, it's good to be with you. Um, this would be a great time to run to the kitchen and pick up some bread and some juice. Um, and if you're here in this room and you did not pick one of these up, go ahead and raise your hand up. Someone will come over to you and, and supply you here. And if you're familiar with these things, you might want to go ahead and start taking off the top part because it's, it's a little funky. I'll give the folks at home a little bit extra time here. Well, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus was uh, in an upper room with his, uh, his closest companions, been traveling with him for a couple of years, and um, they didn't know it, but he did, that this was their last supper together, and um, he began to say a couple things that I'm sure that struck them odd 
but they would come to know them pretty soon and and uh on this side of history we have an idea about what they're about as well we grabbed some bread that was on the table he tore a piece off and he looked at him and he said this is my body broken for you take and eat Then likewise, he picked up a cup of wine that was on the table. And he said, this, this is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink deeply of this cup. do this to remember God and to practice gratitude for what he's done for us. Let's go to him right now. Dear God, we just want to say thank you for what you've done on our behalf. Something that we couldn't have done. I also want to say thank you for your example because earlier in your time with your companions you said greater love has no one and to lay down his life for his friends and you did that so thank you
Let's pray together. God, thank you for that absolute joy that we are set free by your generosity. God, help us to remember that we are free. Help your generosity to inspire generosity in us. God, I pray for Pastor Rob as he comes and brings the word this morning. I pray that you would use him as a vessel to communicate to your congregation and that you would open our hearts and our minds to what he has to say as we grow deeper in our relationship with you and with each other. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What do you think of when you hear the word bless? Bless is actually a pretty common word. We could walk right by it and not notice. Bless isn't a new concept. It has a long history. People who lived in Old Testament times used the Hebrew word for bless, barach. In ancient cultures, people blessed one another with material and social benefits. But there was more to it. Blessings, both bestowed and received, helped create and sustain healthy relationships. They were marked by gratitude and promise keeping. It was a privilege to bless. God is the source of blessing. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, who bestows abundant blessings on all that He has created. Jesus Christ gave the ultimate blessing, His precious life. The Holy Spirit blesses from within with fruit that reflects the nature of God. In this new series, we'll learn what the Bible teaches about blessing others through our generosity and service. Designated as ambassadors of God's generosity, Christians learn to give God's way. When Christians serve others as Christ did, blessings overflow in practical ways. As we follow God's example, we, we too, too will bless. bless. Amen. Good morning. What a great reminder. Sometimes we get going so fast in our lives that we never take the time to count the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. I think we get going that fast and, and, and we just forget about it. We don't pause to take the time we need to to, to reflect on God's blessing. That video is a great, great reminder because it's, it's obviously countercultural to stop and pause, especially to think about blessings and turning around and blessing someone else. In fact, our culture today says what? Our culture today says, man, gratify yourself. Indulge yourself. Get what's coming to you, baby. This is yours. Get what is yours. Stick it to the man. Right? Like that's, that's so what our culture is all about. That's what they're, they're preaching at us. And a, and a lot of times we get caught up in that. I'm so thankful for God's word that I can follow that, that it's the plumb line of my life. As, a, as the scripture says itself, it's a, it's, a, it's a lamp to my feet, it's a light into my path so I don't get caught going down those rabbit holes and believing, getting caught up that, that it's all about me. Because it's really not. Because Jesus said in his own words, right? Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, it's not about gratifying yourself. If you want to be my disciple, the first thing is self-denial. You're denying yourself first. If you want to come follow me, you deny yourself, take up your cross, and then you can follow Jesus. God didn't call us to selfishness, right? He didn't call us to laziness. He called us to be great ambassadors of generosity. He called us to be great stewards of blessings. That's what he has called us to be. Even Solomon talked about that in Proverbs 21. Solomon said he was talking about, he was addressing the lazy, he was addressing the selfish people, and he said, the righteous give without holding back. They give without holding anything back. Now, Scientific studies show that all human beings are basically selfish. I know you didn't know that before you walked in here this morning, so you're welcome. It goes on to say, and, and get this, men are more generally selfish than women. As a rule, studies show that the male neural reward system is more stimulated by self-centeredness. In other words, women are more likely to get a dopamine rush out of helping other people. Men are more focused on surviving. Women are more focused on helping others survive. It's just the way that we're wired, right? And men 
If you're in good shape, the news doesn't get any better. I'm sorry. Research shows big muscles lead to a heart that's more self-centered. I shared this breaking news to my wife the other day, and she said, well, Rob, it's a good thing that you have a big heart. I said, oh, what, what, who am I? But men aren't the only ones who are selfish. Here's the comeback. Here's the comeback story, guys, right? Because another, just a few years ago, another survey revealed that women are less likely to answer the door when a charitable organization comes knocking. Nine out of 10 women also, when splitting a chocolate bar with another woman, will always take the bigger piece. But the point is the same, right? The point is the same that we are all selfish. We all fall into that sometimes. I mean, if, if we've not seen a good example of that, I mean, just think back almost yesterday, right, to 2020, we saw selfishness come out in ways that we never dreamed that selfishness would come. We saw people declaring, that is my last gallon of water on the shelf. That is my last package of toilet paper. Don't you dare. And man, people, we saw people just lose their minds and get silly over the smallest things. That's not what God has called us to. When was the last time that we got to experience intentional generosity? And by that, I mean generosity to where we don't have to count the cost, where we don't have to look over our shoulder. We're just, we're just giving, we're just being generous. When was the last time we experienced intentional generosity? Our, our passage this morning, Paul is encouraging uh, the, a church, kind of like what I'm doing here this morning, encouraging them about getting involved and getting uh, in generosity. And, and, and I think about that, I think about this church, and, and, and I want us to, to stand as we read God's word this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 8, if you have this marked. It says this in verse... Verse 1 it says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality, their freedom. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this not as we had expected, but they gave first, they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that has, as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. Verse 7, but just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I'm not speaking this as a command but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You may be seated. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. So let's look at that, that church in Corinth for just a second. I mean, Paul has gathered the churches and he's, and he's sharing about what's happening in these other churches of, in, in, the, in Macedonia. And he, and he writes, and he says that their, their poverty basically overflows in a wealth of generosity. These churches have been giving beyond their means and they are inviting other people to be a part of the ministry, to get involved. That's what intentional generosity looks like. Sometimes it looks irrational. It doesn't look normal, right? Think about this, you spend your entire weekend here at the church, to, we're doing a, a church-wide community outreach, and, and to make sure the event goes off without a hitch, we need all hands on deck, and we, and we, and we call upon you, and you come and you serve from Friday night all the way through Sunday afternoon, and it's, it's a great thing, and then you go back to work on Monday, and you're standing around the cubicles, and someone says, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, well, man, I, I served at my church the entire time, it was, it was amazing, and they're like, what? Your entire weekend you spent at church. See, to our world, that's, that's irrational. That's completely countercultural, and that's what Paul is trying to, to get them like, to buy into. Like, hey, this is, this is bigger than just us. So this morning, what I want to do is I, I want to, uh, 
I want to look at three mindsets of generosity in Scripture. But as we do that, I, I want you to be thinking about two different questions. The first question is, where do we find blessing in these mindsets of generosity? Where do we find blessing in these mindsets of generosity? The, the second question is, how can we be great ambassadors of generosity in these three mindsets? It, it, the, first, the first mindset is, is the bag mindset. And in the bag mindset, I can't ever get enough in the bag. I can't ever get enough in here. Man, I, I, I want to do things. I want to give the man. I'm constantly, I'm constantly trying to put more and more in the bag. When is, when is more going to be enough? When is, when is more going to be, be taken care of? And what's happening is, like, I, you know, I, m- I remember when, when my parents, when we moved from a small town to the big city of Orlando, for the next several years, it was really, really tight. And so I, I kept hearing those phrases like, hey, money doesn't grow on trees. Hey, we're going to have to be a part of that next year because we're trying. We just didn't feel like we could get enough in the bag. And what was happening here, even in, in, in Haggai's time, is, is that they, the people were not putting God first. We look back at, at chapter 1 of Haggai, and we see that people were not putting God first. In fact, the building of the temple took a back seat to their agenda. Haggai 1.6 says, you have sown much but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not excess. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Many people live this way. It's guarded. Man, I want to be generous. I want to give to God's ministry, but I I just, I got to get, I got to take care of this first. I got to do this first. And the way we talk, the way we respond, it reveals this bag mindset. The way we, we react to things reveals the, the bag mindset. There's just the sense also to have to protect it. This is mine. Hey, this is, that, that's my water. That's my chocolate bar. That's my time. That's my money. Sense of protection in this bag mindset. Do you remember, um, do you remember Judas, the guy that betrayed Jesus? Judas carried a bag. He was, he was in charge of, of the money, and, and Judas was, was carrying the bag, and, and, and Judas had a different mindset. And there's a, there's a great story in the Gospel of Mark. It tells a story of, of a woman who they were hanging out one night, and, and, and she obviously in her life had made some poor choices, but when she met Jesus, Jesus turned her life around. And so out of an abundance of her heart, she gave without holding back. She took a jar an entire jar of perfume, opened it up, poured it on top of Jesus, and just lavished him with it. She was giving without holding back. And she was, it was an act of worship because of, what, of who he was and what he had done for her. She had experienced God's goodness. So she's just repaying. It's just an act of worship. And Judas lost his mind. <laughs> Judas said, woman, are you crazy? Are you absolutely out of your mind? Because what, what is that, that's got to be a year's worth of wages. You could have taken that. You could have taken that. You could have sold that. And you could have taken that money and then, and then fed the poor. And what Judas didn't understand, he had a, had a distorted view of not only money, but he had a distorted view of what generosity looks like. I like to think of it, Judas had an arm problem. Because every time you turn around, Judas had his arm in somebody else's back. I mean, he was protective of the bag, but every time you, he got a little to put in, he put a little bit in his own bag. That's the bag mindset. In the bag mindset, in the mentality, we, we can never, never have enough. And the other thing about the bag is that, that there's holes in it we don't even realize. And it's not just monetary things that are falling out of the bottom of the bag. We're being robbed also of contentment and joy and peace and love and many other fruits of the Spirit this leads us to the, to the second mindset here, and that is, that is the, uh, the, the basket mindset. Now, in the basket mindset, in the bag mindset, there's not enough, never enough. In the basket mindset, there is enough. We look at, look at a couple uh, options here in Scripture that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 2 and, and following, it says that all these blessings will come upon you. They will overtake you if you obey the Lord. And then the people of Haggai in this time, they, they had lost focus of what they were supposed to be doing. They didn't rebuild the temple. So they're being reminded. In verse 5, it says, blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. There will be enough. See, in this mindset, you can rest 
and trust God that there will be enough. Let's look at it from a New Testament standpoint. If you look at Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. Notice he did not say keep and it will be given to you. He didn't say hoard and it will be given to you. He said give and it will be given to you. He goes on to say, he says, give and it will be given to you. They will pour out of your lap a good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. For your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Why did Jesus say this? Give and it shall be given. Because he knew that they were going to do one of two things with it. Give it away, or they were going to bury it. You have to think through that mindset for just a minute. What does that look like? A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I started thinking about what is the imagery of such a phrase. And I thought, aha, I've got it. And I present to you exhibit A, the Slurpee. I remember as a kid riding my bike up to 7-Eleven and, and, you, and you get that Slurpee cup and you go up the machine and you put whatever your favorite is in there, strawberry, banana, whatever it is, uh, and, and you fill it up as much as you can and then you like jam a straw into it and you just suck as much as you can out until you can't fill your brain anymore and then you go back and you top, top it off and you walk over the counter and then you pay, right? I, mean, I don't know if you remember those days, but like <laughs> by 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, you walk into 7-Eleven and the Slurpee machine area looked like a Slurpee bomb had gone off. It was a mess. And I don't know if that's what the motivation was to invent what they invented next. That was the Slurpee lid. Oh, man, when that came out, oh, my, it changed life, right? Because like, now we can t- stick that thing up there, and we can, we can go full, full on and, and just fill that thing up, like compact it all the way down, press it down, right, and just jam it up in there, go until it's completely overfilling over the top, running over, pressed down, shaken together. Man. You see, the the people that Jesus is teaching, this crowd listening to Jesus, they have a great contextual understanding of what he's saying when he says that. Because this, he says, because they knew that in that day, a rich landowner who was employing hourly waged workers tells them that at the end of the week, if there's anything left over, set it at the edge of the field. And that way, anyone who is hungry, anyone who is down, and struggling to feed their family, they can come by and they can receive it as a gift because as God has blessed us, we want to be a blessing to other people. And so if you, as an hourly wage worker, if that was your job, I mean, my, my job all day is to, to fill grain in my basket, throw it up and haul it all the way on the other side of the field and sit it down closer to where the barn is, right? But my mentality has to change because if I'm just an hourly wage worker, I'm thinking like, man, this is, this is my job for the day, right? I'm doing this all day long. I'm not trying to kill myself out here, right? So I'm just going to go and I'm going to fill it up, maybe three quarters away, kind of loosely in there, whatever, and take it and haul it over, right? But if I know that at the end of the week, the excess is going to be used to bless either my family or my neighbor's family who are, who are struggling, who are hungry right now, then what is my basket going to look like when I pack it then? Press down shaken together, everything I can possibly get in there, running over the top. Why? Because I want to take it across over here and I want to lay it down at the end of the week into the field so someone else can receive that blessing. It's about, the, it's about a change in our attitude. It's about a change in our perspective and in our heart. Because you see what happens is when I, when I, when I set this down, what, what, what I give to God, if I don't lay it before, what I lay before God in, in, in front of him, he can take and multiply way beyond what I could ever imagine. Because what is mine remains mine. What I identify as God's becomes everybody's. I think in this Gospel of Luke, Jesus is encouraging, he's encouraging us to go above and beyond what our culture says is, is generosity. And that is foreign today. Because everybody, the culture says, look out for number one. He says, give, and it shall be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over. It's interesting that that verse doesn't say what's to be given, but I think if you go on and you read the passage after that, and the following verses, I think it starts to lean into what some of those things are. It's it's show mercy to others. Do good for others. 
Don't demand your rights to be heard in front of others. It's all about other people. See, a lot of people associate that verse with money. And Jesus is like, oh, no, 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 no. It's, it's so, so much bigger than that. He's talking about our heart. He's talking about our intentions with generosity. Because God can take that and multiply it in ways I never could have, ways that you never, the ways our church could never. God can take our gift and multiply it. We see this in 1 Kings chapter 17. The woman, a widow from Zarephath, and, and she has just enough oil in her jar, just enough flour left in her basket to make one last little bread cake for her and her son. And she goes out and she's gathering sticks to build this fire to cook this last little bread cake before they start to fall into starvation. And she runs into the prophet Elijah and he says, bake for me this bread cake. Serve me first. In other words, trust God first, and then you and your family will eat for a long, long time. That is irrational. That doesn't sound right. That's a huge step of faith and trust. But she does it. And what happens? She, she gives Elijah the first, and then she goes back, and, and what do you know? There's more, a tiny bit more of oil in her, in her jar. There's, there's a little bit more flour in her basket, just enough to make the next bread cake. To, and she goes on, and this happens, happens times and times again. And her family does not fall into starvation. Her family is fed for days and weeks to come. It's that basket mentality. There is always enough. There is beyond that. This is the way the, the poor Macedonian church was thinking. It didn't matter if they had a lot. It didn't matter if they had little. It was that they made their first commitment to God. And God bless that. Paul writes in, in verse 3, going back to 2 Corinthians, he writes in verse 3, he says, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. Watch this. Begging us with much, urging for the favor of participation in support of the saints. In other words, they're trying to invite people into this ministry, and not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Man, they gave themselves first to the Lord. That, that changes the mindset of how, how we think sometimes. So their, their passion, they had a generous undertaking to complete. Verse 6, so we urged Titus as he had previously made a beginning so he would also complete in you this gracious word. This was a, a ministry that Titus had, had helped out at the beginning. So Paul is encouraging the church at Corinth here to join with the Macedonian churches. It's not about how much they're bringing, right? It's that their heart's in the right place when they bring it. And God looks at us and says the same thing. God gets a great amount of joy when you and I give with the right attitude, when we bless with the right attitude, when we receive his blessings and turn around and bless someone else. And I'm not talking money. I want you to see it's way bigger than that. Generosity has to do with all, every aspect of our life. It's the barn mindset is what this leads to. Paul writes in verse 7, but just as you have abound in everything in faith and utterance and knowledge and all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. And so, I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, have them build a barn in here this week. Budget was a little tight, but, but I think you see this picture, you understand. A barn with a, with a grain silo, it's full, it's ready, the storehouse is full. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord from your wealth, from the, from the first of all you pro your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty. The storehouses are ready. These are talking about our first fruits. Matthew 6, 33, why, what God wants our first, right? Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and what? All these things will be added to you. We often think about, like, we often think about tithe, right? We all, I'll say, you know, that tithe, and people are like, oh, can't believe I stumbled in here on the day that the pastor's talking about money. No, this isn't about that. Please understand that. But we think about it because tithe, 10%, that, man, that's a scary number sometimes. It is a scary number, but I want you to understand, this isn't about a percentage. This isn't about a fraction. This isn't about a dollar amount. This is about where our hearts are. See, in the, in the barn mindset, it's, it, there, there's always enough. It's overflowing. You see, in God's 90-day outlook financially, there's plenty. We just have to steward it well and be generous with it. 
This goes back to the Old Testament, right? And God is telling Moses, he's like, hey, I want the first, uh, how you worship me, dedicate to me every firstborn among the Israelites, the first offspring to be born, both human and animals. Look, when your sheep have lambs, I want the first one. Don't wait until the 10th one when you find out whether or not you're going to have a good flock. I want the first. I want the first. This can be hard sometimes. Think about this. Who was, who was Jesus? He was the first born, the Lamb of God. God gave, Romans 5 says, uh, God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God gave his son to us first. We're over here as sinners, don't even know that we need a savior yet. And God gave his son first. And we honor him by coming to him first with everything. Man, I remember when I was, when we, Audrey and I were in seminary and uh, just starting out in our marriage and, and we didn't have a lot of money, right? And so we're living in this little apartment and, and uh, there were many nights where we had some interesting things for dinner, I'll just say that. And, uh, but we, we had this conversation and, and I said, are we, gonna, are we gonna pay our bills at the end of the month? <clears throat> if so, can we still give to the church that we're working at? Or do we pay our bills first and then give to the church or do we give first and then pay the bills? Man, she was so faithful. She was so steadfast. And she's like, we're going to give first and see whatever happens. And see whatever happens turned into potato chip chicken for dinner some nights. You ever had that? All right. Ramen noodles. Going out a date to McDonald's and sharing a strawberry shake. It was awesome. I wouldn't trade those days for anything. You know why? Because we saw God be faithful so many times. There were bills that got paid at the end of the month where you're just going like, I don't know. I don't. And it's bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. That we have to trust God with that. We have to trust God with what he has given us. Stop trusting what could or couldn't be in the bag and operate out of the barn. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything that's in our bank account right now. He owns all of our time. I'll be honest, that's something that I struggle with sometimes. I can just be transparent, man. My time, like it's it's little. And when I get a when I get a minute, I'm like going, I'm like, oh no, 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 no. This is my time. I get I get this little time over here. I either gonna go spend it on my family or I'm gonna go spend it with, with a friend or, or whatever. And then you get that call, right? Hey Rob, somebody needs to you to come down to the church and talk to him about this or about that. And I'm like, oh man. Are you kidding? It's like 10 minutes before kickoff. I'm just kidding. I know you've never had that thought. But what do we do? How do we respond when God calls us into situations like that? Our time, we have to be generous with our time. Sitting down and listening to someone, that's being generous with your time. That's offering up generosity to God. It's always always exciting to watch students grow up. To come to them, watch them, come alongside them, when they, when they step into those next steps of their, their, uh, their faith journey. And many years ago, we had a student that, that came through our ministry at a, at a previous church. And, and we walked with him and his family through some times. And, and just, just, it was great, but it was hard sometimes. And turned out to be a remarkable young man. And he graduated, went to college, got married, started doing some entrepreneurial stuff because he had that mindset God started blessing him, and and together, they began to ask God, what do you want us to do with this excess that's coming in? I mean, they they just had, they launched some things, and it just, God just blessed it because they were faithful. They said, God, what do you want us to do with this excess? So he said he prayed, and and God gave him this vision. He says, says, I want to go out, and I want to buy some land in in different places, and I want to build, like, retreat camps. So that, so that the pastors can go there, so that ministry leaders can go there and be refreshed, be rejuvenated, so that Christian couples can go there and be, be reunited. It's like, man, for a young couple, this, is, this, is, this vision's incredible, right? And that was the vision God gave him because he said, he said, if I put my identity in a dollar sign, God made it very clear that he was going to lead a life that was going to lead to emptiness. And so they continued down this, this plan that they had and the next thing you know, she, God is impressed upon her. And he gives his wife all the credit here. And he says, he says, man, God impressed upon her when she was praying not long after that. Like, why are you waiting? And they're like, oh, well, God, we don't have the land yet. We're still trying to figure this part out, that kind of a thing. Why are you waiting? Do it now. So they came up with a plan to do it now. And they're like, okay, 
You're gonna have to trust God with this, whatever. And so, and so they did. Now, fast forward, months later, I'm sitting in my living room and I'm opening a letter and I'm reading this letter and it's, and it's from this couple. And honestly, to, to be honest with you, we get a lot of letters that <clears throat> ask for support when some of the former students come and they're like, hey, we're about to start this ministry, we're about to go on the mission field, we're gonna do this trip, whatever. Great, and we, we'll write the check, try, do, do whatever we can to help them, right? And that's what I kind of thought this was at first. And then as I began to re read, I, I, was, I stood up and I was like, oh my gosh, I could not believe the generosity that was coming out of their hearts, out of this letter. And I got up and I walked over and I was like, Audra, come here, come here. I said, is this real? I was like, oh my gosh. I said, Rob, we, we thank you for everything that you've done. You've blessed us and because God has blessed us, we now wanna bless you and your family. And we wanna send you on this vacation that you could never do on your own. It's like, whoa, 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 man, this is, this is hard position for me to be in. Like I'm the one, like I like to roll my sleeves up and serve, 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 serve. That's just who I am, right? Like to be on this end of it, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And so we, we talked and, and I was like, man, listen, I appreciate it. This is a great gesture, but, but he's like, no, 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 you've got to. Like this is, this is the joy that, that God has told us to pursue. I'm like, oh my gosh. And sure enough, COVID played some havoc, but we, they continued to pursue this. And next thing you know, we're on vacation out west and we're staying in places, I'm gonna be honest with you, I could never stay in. And it was incredible that I got to bless my family with this. It was incredible. Now this is, this is on the south rim, outside the south rim of, of, of the Grand Canyon. I know it looks like we're in Tatooine, but it was super cool, right? And so we're in one of these on a Tuesday night of that week. Now it'd be great if the story ended there and we got blessed, right? But here's what happened next. On the Tuesday night, in the coolness of the night, we got a fire going in this little, this little pod looking thing. And we did this little survey with our family. And we asked them questions and asked everybody to, to answer five questions. And to hear my sons share back with us the definition of who our family is, who they see us to be as parents, setting mission goals for our family over the next year. Man, to hear this come back, man, tears are welling up in my eyes and I'm like, I can't believe this. This is probably one of the, the biggest highlights of my parenting career. Maybe I haven't screwed this thing up so bad, right? I would have missed out on that blessing. Audrey and I would have missed out on that incredible blessing had we not received the gift of generosity by this couple. We would have also missed out on it if they had not been obedient to give to God first. We were blessed because of who God was and what he's done in our life. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then I'm going to go change as we get ready for the next part of our worship service today, which is baptism, and so we'll be out. But as, as Marsh leads, leads us in this song, and there's a lyric I want you to focus on. It says, oh, the joy I've found surrendering my crowns at the feet of the king who surrendered everything. Let's pray. Oh, God, we come before you today. Father, we, we come before you with our, our hearts postured to receive your blessing, postured to return those blessings and generosity to others around us. God, may we, we read this passage today. May we be encouraged to, to count the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, but to then go and turn and to bless other people our neighbors, our coworkers, our family, the people in this community. May we be a blessing to them as we are great ambassadors of generosity. For we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said.
Well, listen, I, I want to say something, so try to take me seriously in these next two seconds. It is a look. 
Thank you. I appreciate that, Marsh. Listen, I want to say this from the bottom of my heart. We, we appreciate the fact that you're here today. You're online. We appreciate the fact that you're here with us at Northland. We've been through some tumultuous times, and we know that you have been faithful. And in this series, Blessed, not one person is going to get up here and ask you for one more dime. You have my word. So we know that you're faithful. We know that you're here, that you're all in, and you're getting ready for what God is about to do here. Amen? God is raising up a lead pastor right now. He's raising up a family that's going to come and be a part of what God is already doing here at Northland Church. And so we're excited about that. And we want to make sure that our heart is in the right place, in a posture of generosity, so that we don't stand in the way of what God wants to do. Amen? Are you ready? A lot of moving parts in these next few moments, so here we go. The reason, I know you're jealous that you, can't, that you didn't wear this today. I'm going to quit rolling my jeans up here. The reason I'm dressed like that is because in a moment, we're going to go out right back out here, right outside Artisans, go out this way, right through those doors, and we're going we're gonna to have a time of baptism, and it's going to be great. We're going to celebrate with people who are experiencing life change in their life and celebrating it. If they're following Jesus, amen. And so I'm excited about that. I got a, cu- a couple of instructions. So if you're one of those that's getting baptized or if you're a volunteer that's working specifically in that, would you just go make your way out to the hub right now and, uh, and go ahead and be a part of that? And so we'll see you in a few minutes. This is an extension of our service. This is, I, I was like, no, this is part of the service. It's gonna be warm outside. There's about 20 people that are gonna be getting baptized today. Amen. So what we've got to do is we've got to go out there and we've got to celebrate with them. If the heat is too much or you don't want to stand that long, you can stay right here. The band is going to continue to play and sing in here and out there, and you will not miss anything. If you stay in here and stay seated, you will not miss anything. We'll show it right up here, there, somewhere. If you've not registered yet, you're sitting here thinking like, man, Rob, Marsh, I wish that I had registered. I wish that I could get baptized today. Marsh, is it too late? Nope. Thank you, man of his word. No, it's not. You can leave right now and go to the hub. Doesn't matter if you brought a towel. Doesn't matter if you brought a change of clothes. We'll get you taken care of. But you can go now. Say, man, I want to get baptized today. I want to take that next step. I want to publicly proclaim that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. So if that's you and you're like, I didn't register, Rob. I'm like, it's okay. Marsh said it was okay. You go now, and we'll get you connected. Move to the hub. Get checked in. If you have children, you're going to have time, a quick minute, to go and to pick your kids up and then to come out and join us for the celebration. We're going to wait till that happens and come out there. So there's going to be a few minutes where we're going to start to move in worship outside. People will help you, direct you where to go. I'm looking forward to this. So we're going to go now. You're going to lead us in song. And I'm going to go, and we're going to start this next part of our our worship celebration. Amen? All right. We'll see you out there. Great. 
for leading us in worship. Thank you all for your patience. I think uh, we've allowed most of our families to get back from the children's wing, so thank you guys for being patient as we celebrate with these today. You know, the waters of baptism are proclaiming the gospel in and of itself. It's the gospel message that Jesus has died for our sins, was buried, and lives again at the right hand of the Father. By joining in baptism, these great people today that are joining us, or identifying themselves with him, raised to walk in the newness of life. And so today in Romans 6.3 it says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in the newness of life. These guys don't know it today, but... They're preaching a message with what they're doing today without even using any words. What you guys are doing is showing the world that you are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate, all look around, all these people are here today because they love you, brothers and sisters in Christ supporting you, and we're excited to be a part of this. Heaven comes to 
fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm
couldn't fail me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Can you sing this with me? Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is.
Wow, what a day, what a day. We will forever remember this day, amen? amen. Pastor Gus is going to lead us in a closing prayer. Before we do, just remember, Father, we have done as you have commanded, and yet still there is room in these waters. May they continue to stir with the generosity of the gospel, amen? We're going to do two prayers. One, we're going to thank God for those who have been baptized and all of those believers who are here. But we're also going to pray, for, if you have not trusted Jesus as your Savior, you haven't acknowledged you're a sinner and acknowledged that God loves you. And if you haven't believed, and the Bible says as many as receive him, they give them the right to become a child of God. And if you can commit and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and receive him in your heart, they'll be rejoicing in heaven just like we are rejoicing here. Father, we come to you in the power of the gospel, which is of God unto salvation. We thank you for the message of the gospel that these candidates who have been baptized today, they have done that in obedience to your word. Father, we just praise you and we pray for their parents. We pray for their grandparents, their uncle, their aunts, and all their friends who gathered here in their church to, Father, observe the ceremony. We give you the glory, Lord, alone. Father, if there's anyone who's been struggling and facing the challenge and confused and doubting that Jesus loves him, Father, in the sound of my voice, with that person say, Lord, I believe. Father, may you answer that silent or that audible prayer right now. If somebody say, Jesus, by what I have seen the gospel proclaim, you, I will receive you as my Savior. And now, Lord, may every one of us go from this place with a deep commitment to love Jesus. May we go from this place with a deep commitment that we will add and will multiply into the kingdom of God. May we go and be a witness and declare Jesus in our homes, in our place of work, in our neighborhoods, and everywhere. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, and God bless you all.